Welcome to Network 13, and today we're going to be doing our our follow-up video to the Schmidt Trigger NAND gate oscillator. Today we're going to be building another oscillator based on a logic gate, but this time we're going to be using a quartz crystal to select the frequency of operation. And very briefly, because crystals and oscillators are whole subjects unto themselves and we don't really need to get into it that deep right now. A quartz crystal, however, is it's a piece of quartz and it has an electrode on either side and some kind of a holder mechanism and there are leads that come out. And the electrical model of the quartz crystal, it looks like this. It looks like a series LCR network in parallel with another capacitor. Now, the series LCR, or CLR in this case, the way I drew it, these aren't real components. These are how the circuit behaves. It looks like this, but these aren't actually real components. This one, however, is a real component. CO is the value of the leads, the electrodes, the holder, the kind of physical parts of the crystal. So this is in parallel with CO, and that's what this presents to your circuit. Now, a quartz crystal has a series resonant frequency and a parallel resonant frequency. And if you're operating in the series resonant mode, it looks like a low impedance in your circuit. So the voltage across C and L will cancel each other out, and you'll be left with a resistor, it'll look like, to your circuit. In parallel mode, it's going to look like a tank circuit. So the currents will cancel each other out, and it will just look like a, uh, a voltage, an oscillating voltage. But it'll be a high impedance present a high impedance to your circuit. Now down here we have the actual circuit we're going to be using today. This is a Pierce crystal oscillator circuit and this uses a logic gate and we have various components connected here. We have RF which is a biasing resistor and this is usually a, a pretty high value. It's in, it's in mega ohms and the biasing resistor is used to bias the input um, at about you know, half supply voltage. Now, usually in digital logic, you either want a one or a zero. You want the circuit to be on or off. You never want it to be halfway between these states, though. <laughs> that's that's where the unpredictability comes in. You don't want unpredictability in a digital circuit. So, however, in this case, we exploit this unpredictability by keeping the input at half supply voltage. Uh, this resistor here is an isolation RS. It's an isolation resistor and this is used it has a couple of purposes. Along with C2 it provides some phase shift to the output and it also limits the amount of drive to the crystal. Well, one of the parameters the crystal has is drive level and it's in in this particular case this crystal the drive level maximum is one microwatt so you never want to dissipate more than one microwatt in the crystal itself because you can damage it, you can break it, uh, physically damage it. So that's two purposes of the isolation resistor. Um, this of course is the crystal itself and we have two capacitors C1 and C2 and these two values are typically the same. In this case today we're going to be, they're going to be 22 picofarad each and the capacitance here is works into this expression for load capacitance. This is an important parameter for this circuit, load capacitance. The crystal, when it's manufactured, and when they adjust the frequency, when they, they spec a certain frequency, it's assuming a certain load capacitance. And you have to be pretty close to this value when you design your circuit. And load capacitance consists of, it'll be C1 plus CI, which is the input capacitance of your gate, multiplied by C2 plus CO, which is the output capacitance of your gate. And this is all over this expression, C1 plus CI plus C2 plus CO. And then there's another piece here, CS, which is the stray capacitance of your circuit. Now, stray capacitance consists of your circuit board traces, 
to ground. It consists of your component leads. Um, you know, this kind of stuff here I mentioned before, the, the CO, this is part of stray capacitance. And if you design this properly and, it, and it's built properly and you have a good, a good layout, um, this circuit will oscillate and it'll put out a nice, a nice square wave which you can use as a clock in your circuit or whatever you need it for. Okay, this is the data sheet for the crystal that I'm using in this circuit. And this crystal was manufactured by ECS. And the part number is ECS38X. That's the one I'm using. And a brief description, this is a tuning fork type crystal. Um, and let's see, used as a clock source in communications equipment, measuring instruments, microprocessors, and other time management applications. So... You see these things a lot in, in, in little cheap clocks, and you might see them in a, uh, a digital watch or um, something like that. And frequency of oscillation is 32.768 kilohertz. Now, if you take this frequency and you divide it by 2, you divide that by 2, you divide that by 2. Divide it by 2 enough times, you get to 1 hertz, right? So 1 hertz is what you want. If you're building a clock, you want one clock pulse every second. So, for my crystal, the ECS38X, nominal frequency 32.768 kilohertz. Frequency tolerance is plus or minus 20 parts per million, which is change in frequency over FO, which is the nominal frequency. And this is pretty small. I think it works out to be 0.65 hertz or something very, very insignificant. Uh, load capacitance, which is one of the things we mentioned earlier. This crystal wants to see, quote-unquote, 12.5 picofarad across it. Ideally, that's what it wants to see. And drive level, maximum, 1 microwatt. So you never want to dissipate more than 1 microwatt in the actual crystal itself. You could damage it, shatter it, break it. Resistance at series resonance, 35k ohms. So what this means is if you're using this in a circuit where you're using it as a series resonant element. The X sub C will cancel the X sub R, uh, X sub L rather, and you'll be left with a resistance. And this resistance is 35 K ohms in this case. Now the Q, the Q of the crystal is 90,000. That's 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 very high, which means that this is has a very narrow response. The pass band is very 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 narrow. Uh, what else? Temperature coefficient. This will drift a little bit with temperature, of course. 0 0.04 parts per million per degree C maximum. Uh, shunt capacitance. I believe this is the capacitance I mentioned of the leads, the electrodes, the physical holder of, of the crystal. This is 1.6 picofarad, typical. Uh, has an operating temperature range of minus 10 to plus 60 degrees C. Uh, here's a spec for shock resistance. <laughs> Drop test three times on hard wooden board from height of 75 centimeters. Uh, so this, they're telling you here this, you know, this component can be physically damaged or altered by physical shock. So it's probably not a good idea to do that. Um, aging. A crystal will age, it will change value over its lifetime, and they're specking here that it will change no more than plus or minus three parts per million if you're at 25 degrees C operating temperature, and that would be over the lifetime of the component, over the lifetime of the crystal. And uh, let's go down to the package. So the part number is 3x8, and this is just referring to the dimensions of the package, so it's 3.1 millimeters in diameter, 8.2 millimeters in length, the actual can that the crystal is inside of. This is the temperature curve, and you can see that over the temperature range minus 10 to 60, you can expect the frequency to change between 40 parts per million in one direction and maybe 50 in the other. The piece of this of interest today is going to be this application circuit. This is the recommended circuit that ECS uh, 
is put in here. And here are our parts. So we have a logic gate. In this case, it's an inverter. We're going to be using a two sections of a 4001B uh, CMOS, which is a quad NOR gate. So RF um, is 10 mega ohms, our feedback resistor. RD, which we call RS in our other drawing, 330K, which is the value I'm using. And C1 and C2 are 22 picofarad each, which are also values that I'm using. And recommended supply voltage is 3 volts maximum. And I'll show you what happens when you exceed this if you go above 3 volts or above, actually above 3.5 volts. So strange things begin to happen. Um, they're recommending this TC4069P, which is a Toshiba. It's a... Um, a Toshiba part, it's a CMOS, uh, I think it's a hex inverter. I don't have one of these in my inventory, so I use the 4001B. Um, 4001B seems to work fine, as you'll see when we do the demo. And here's a note of caution. In this circuit, low drive level with a maximum of one microwatt is recommended. If excessive drive is applied, irregular oscillation or quartz element fractures may occur. So you have been warned. You have been warned. Okay, so for our oscillator circuit today, we're using a CD4001B, which is a CMOS quad NOR, has four NOR gates in the package. And being CMOS logic, uh, supply voltage recommended is between 3 and 18 volts. And here's the pinout. There will be a link to this data sheet, of course, on our Google Plus page, um, which you can refer to later. Our circuit, make sure I have this centered now. This is our circuit. Okay, so we're going to be using two gates out of this, out of the four gates in the package. We're going to be using this as the actual oscillator, and we're going to be buffering it with this adjacent gate, just so that we're not loading our circuit somehow or interfering with the oscillation of our circuit. We'd buffer it with this gate, and then we can drive our clock or whatever downstream. Not important. Um, before I get started on this explanation, I have two additional sections in the package, okay, as you can see here. And what am I doing? Well, I'm grounding the inputs, okay? I'm grounding the inputs. And why do you ground the inputs? Because if these inputs are floating, if they're not grounded, you don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> and, I'll, and I can show you in the demo what, what could happen if you don't ground them. Um, you don't know what they're going to do. You don't know if they're going to oscillate. You don't know if they're going to latch. You don't know. That's the whole thing. You don't know. You want to know for sure, though. You want to be sure that these aren't going to oscillate and interfere with the rest of your, your circuit. So the easiest thing to do, you can tie them to ground or you can pull them up to the supply. Doesn't matter. They're in a known state here. They're not going to oscillate if you do this. It takes, you know, no time to do this, but the benefits are, the benefits of not having to debug and solve a problem later are, are priceless. Now, this is the oscillator. This is the Pierce Crystal Oscillator Circuit. Um, it's very similar, or almost exactly what you saw in the data sheet that I presented earlier from ECS. You, let's see, I'm tying inputs one and two together on the NOR, which makes it functionally equivalent to just an inverter. And same thing with the buffer stage, tying five and six together. Uh, RF, RF is 10 mega ohms, as recommended in the data sheet. RS, which they call RD in the data sheet, 330K. Um, here's our crystal, the ECS3X8. Not 38X, I was saying 38X in the data sheet part, I should have been saying 3x8, my apologies. <laughs> um, and C1 and C2, 22 picofarad. This is our circuit right here. Okay, now on to our demo. Um, as you can see here, my supply voltage is, oh, just messed it up, 3 volts, okay, more or less. My scope I have an encounter mode here, and it's saying that my output frequency right now is 32.7667 kilohertz, which is really, really close to 32.768, which is would be the nominal, obviously. 
Um, and there's a little bit of overshoot and undershoot on my um, waveform here, but I would attribute that to using one of these wireless breadboards. This is not really the best way to build an oscillator circuit. There's a lot of extra junk here, a lot of extra parasitic crap, if you will. Inductance, capacitance, uh, it's just not the best way, but it's the way I the way I did it here. But, you know, that that's not, I mean, that's really not bad. As you can see, this is very, very stable. It's very, very clean. It's not jittering, really, at all. Um, Frequency is very, very, it's very stable. And that's, that's what you'd want. That's exactly what you'd want, of course. Okay, now, three volts. If we mess with this a little bit, let's say we went up to, and I'm, I'm violating the, uh, the recommended value here in, in the data sheet, but I go up to three and a half volts. Three and a half, three and a half, okay. Frequency, 32.7668, really hasn't changed much at all for a, a fairly significant change in supply voltage. Um, that's like, uh, what did I do, 17% up, okay. If I go down to two and a half, let's say, what happens? Oop, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, okay, close enough. Two and a half volts. Frequency, 32.7664. So, this is not really um, susceptible to pretty significant change in supply voltage. It, the frequency really stays locked in there. If you remember from the Schmidt Trigger NAND video, that circuit, that was very susceptible to supply voltage. Let's do a worst case here. What if I went to two, which is two volts is really asking for trouble because the 4001 really is not designed to work at three at two volts. <laughs> it's, it recommends a lower supply voltage of three, but here, here we are at two. It's still working. Frequency 32.7658. I mean, you'd never do this. If you were going to build this as a clock oscillator in your circuit, you would probably have a dedicated regulator for this, and it would the spy voltage would be very well regulated and clean. It w you wouldn't be doing this with it. It wouldn't be jumping all over the place. So this is really like an extreme case. Now, I was going to show you the other extreme here. And if I go up too high too high here we go it's starting to happen if I go to let's say I go to four volts four volts okay and you can see if you get in close enough that we're starting to see something very odd happen which is oh if I do my hold off I think if I crank this up to and get this to stop jumping around. Yeah, that's about right. So, strange things begin to happen here. Um, you start to get extra pulses <laughs> at the leading and trailing edges as you go up in supply volts. And I'll go even higher, and you can see, oh, here's another one, and here's another one. Now I'm at five and a half volts, um, and this is both, it's both sides doing this. The beginning, the leading and trailing edges are doing this. Um, yeah, this is not a good thing. These are extra clock pulses. This is going to just really mess you up. <laughs> so, um, manufacturer was correct to recommend three volts. Here, because if you're at three volts, you don't get the extra pulses. It looks nice and clean and stable. Da, 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 da. Okay, right there. Nice and clean and stable at three volts. Everybody's happy. Okay, I think we're done with this for now. Um, nothing else to really show you. Um, well, I could show you one more thing. That's not true. I'll show you one more thing. Um, and this has to do with the feedback 
resistor. Let's just say I pulled all my other components out of here. I pull all my other components out. I pull the crystal out, I pull the caps out, and I'm left with just a feedback resistor. Now, what's happening here? We still have an oscillator, don't we? <laughs> we have an oscillator with one component, which is RF. Oh, let's see, let's show you on here. With RF. RF only. Everything else I pulled out. And this guy is oscillating at uh, 1.8 megahertz. Oh, uh, what's going on here? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you're tying the output back to the input, and you're biasing the input um, around half supply voltage, and this is what happens. Um, this is not a desirable condition. Of course, this is not going to be a stable frequency. You're back to basically an RC circuit now at this point. This is not, the crystal's gone. Pull the crystal out, pull everything else out. This is not a desirable condition, but I just wanted to show you that these things can oscillate, these gates. Um, and if you don't properly deal with your inputs on a gate, which I showed you earlier, if you leave gates in one of these packages, if you leave the inputs floating, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. It could oscillate, it could lock up, it could latch, you don't really know. The best thing to do with unused gates, once again, is you ground the inputs or you tie them up to supply, one or the other. But at least they're in a known state then and they're not going to oscillate on you. Okay, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> that's it for real this time. Uh, I will end by saying, um, if you enjoyed this video, which I hope you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Um, if you enjoy the Network 13 videos in general, please feel free to subscribe. I have a number of other videos up right now, uh, different kinds of circuits and different kinds of things, something you may enjoy or find interesting. Um, feel free to leave comments in the comment section below, or you can write to our Network 13 email address, which is network13.contact at gmail.com. It's network number 13.contact at gmail.com. We have our Google Plus page, which I have a link to in the About section of our YouTube channel. The Google Plus page will contain links to the data sheets. Uh, it'll have um, still photos of the exhibits, like the like the things I draw, uh, like this. <laughs> it'll it'll have these. It'll have sometimes there's links to other useful uh, uh, information, um, other websites. Uh, you know, if, if there's anything uh, above and beyond what you see in the video. Um, it may be there. It may be helpful to you. Hopefully it is. Okay, I think this is it. Uh, and I will end by saying, as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>